Welcome everyone to a brand new episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. I am so excited to speak to my guest this week. He is simply put one of the greatest combat sports athletes of all time. He was in a very high profile title fight recently. The result didn't go his way, but there is so much to discuss. It is the one and only Henry Triple C Sahudo. Henry, how you doing, my man? I'm doing good, brother. I'm doing good. I could be better, but you know, we, we uh, <laughs> it's 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 a good time. And I'm here in Brazil with the family. And after my fight against Aljo, I decided to come out and spend some time with my uh, with my wife. A much needed a much needed vacation. It's been about two years since we've uh, come to Brazil, so enjoy my time here now. I love it. You know what? I have to say, you are a man of your word. We were supposed to do this prior to UFC 288 and we couldn't make it happen but like I said you're a man of your word and post event post fight we're finally having the conversation first and foremost physically mentally emotionally now that some time has passed since the Sterling fight how are you feeling um uh, I'm feeling good I just uh I just know that you know even after my fight I felt like I was going to you know if, if I ain't first, I'm last, you know, I'm I'm not doing this just to fight. I'm doing this to be the best in the world. And if I can't be the best in the world, and I don't want none of the cake, even though it was a split decision call, it's just, it's just confusion, you know, but at, the next day after waking up, I'm just thinking, this is the best guy that you guys have. And, 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 and I knew the mistakes that I made and the adjustments. If I can get, you know, one more fight before I fight this guy again, I says, I'm going to take my chances. So there's there's a chip in my shoulder now, Sandu, and it's uh, it's just it's 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 dangerous for me to have that because man, I don't like be behind nobody, and I feel like now you know even if it was a close fight, like whatever it is, like a loss is a loss, whether I think I won or not, or whether people think I won or not, if the judges score it different, then you got to go with the people who are who've been equipped to score a fight the way they have to score it. I'm just I'm still tripping on on round five. But I also do know that some of the other rounds were pretty close, and I know they could have gone either way. Well, so we're gonna get we're gonna get to all of that. Said, yeah, absolutely. We're gonna we're gonna get to the scorecards and everything. But prior to the fight, what was the kind of game plan going into the fight? What were you hoping to achieve with five rounds against Sterling? Um, uh, it was control the distance. Uh, but at the same time, I also knew that if he was gonna be rangy and a little tricky, that I was gonna do kind of Mexican style, bring the pressure. Um, but I don't, I don't know, man. I'm not too happy about my performance. I don't even want to give the game plan away because I don't even think I did the, even the game plan. Mm. You know, uh, I just pretty much had to fight the way I typically don't fight. But I had, you know, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And it was the best that I could give. What is it, the best of me? No. But it was the best that I could give at that time. And it's the same reason why it just doesn't sit well with me. Mm. You know, Uh a lot of mistakes that I made, a lot of adjustments that I should have made that I didn't make. Uh, the only the only time that I really kind of pat myself on the back was just the fifth round of being able to kind of pull that through, knowing that the rest of the rounds were kind of close. Um, you know, the fifth was, I mean, the fourth was definitely his. But I just don't know. I did it. This is actually my first interview, so you're getting the best. You can, you're going to get the best of me here because I'm just, I'm an open book. And I appreciate that. One thing I want to ask before we kind of get into the scorecards and the rounds, did you feel any cage rust with the long layoff coming into this fight? And did you even feel anything during the fight? Uh, the, the, the rust, it, it was more of the inexperience. You know what I'm saying? Like physically, I felt physically, I felt good. The inexperience of being able to steal rounds, kind of some of the things that Al Germain did that I didn't do. That's the stuff that kind of bothers me. So it wasn't so much of the cage rust. It was more of forgetting the inexperienced thing or the experiences that I used to do that I didn't do. You know, and uh, and that's that's kind of where I fall out now, you know? Right. You've brought up the scorecards a few times. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through it. Round one, 10-9, 10-9, 10-9 to Sterling. Unanimous with all three judges. Round two, 10-9 Sahudo, 10-9 Sahudo, 10-9 Sterling, right? Then we go into round three, 10-9, 10-9, 10-9, all for Sahudo. That's unanimous. Round four, 
10 9, 10 9, 10 9, all unanimous for Sterling. And then round five, 10 9, Sahudo. 10 9, Sterling. 10 9, Sahudo. And so there are two rounds here where the judges didn't unanimously agree with each other. Round two, Eric Colon scored it 10 9 for Sterling. The other two judges scored it in your favor. And then round five, we had Derek clearly give it to Sterling 10 9. And that seems to be the one where it feels like it was one of the easier rounds to score that fifth round in your favor and had clearly just given you that round. We're looking at a completely different result here. Would you agree with that? Uh, the, yeah, of course, 100 percent. But I, I almost feel like the second round was uh, the first, the second and fifth were like my best rounds, I believe. Mm -hmm. I've only watched the fight one time. But it's also it's also a hard fight to judge when a super good parity is super close, you know. But I mean, I, I just think like Derek Cleary, uh, who was a judge that had stiffed me once before with uh, Joseph Benavides. So I just don't know. I just don't know where that shit comes from. You know, if there's any, if there's any round that was pretty decisive, I believe the whole world would 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 agree. It was that fifth round. So I don't know what I did. I don't know what is it. I don't know if he likes the persona or whatever, but I don't know. Whatever it is, man, he didn't give me that round. I just thought it was uh, a bit unjust. I think if there are closer rounds, it was from, from one of four, you know, but to not give me the fifth is like, it's, it's a little crazy. And the, th the thing is, the thing is, Sandu, it's like, I'm not bitter, man. I'm not bitter because I know the potential that I could, that, that I could take it. I know what I, could have done and I didn't do that. Uh, that's more of what bothers me. Mm. You know, it's not so much the loss, but being able to give more of your best tactically, technically, and be able to do it rather than just win by a threat. Like I don't, I don't like that. You know. Yeah, there was a great video on your YouTube channel where you basically, I think, later on that night, rewatched the fight. Um. When you were rewatching it, and now that you've had some time to kind of think on it and stew on it, can you see the the areas and and the moments in the fight that perhaps you could have done a little bit more to to decisively, you know, get maybe some of those rounds that the judges perhaps favored St Sterling in? Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent, and then particularly it was really round one. I was winning round one until I decided to uh, to kind of relax a little bit and then get taken down by the cage. I mean, he stole that round, you know. I was, I mean, that's one round that really, that kind of kind of started pushing the pace of the fight. And, you know, Algerman started getting a little more comfortable. Because Algerman, Algerman's really good with his wrestling off against the cage. But when it comes to just pure wrestling, like off the open, like he had nothing. And I, well, we knew that. Um, but we have to give credit where credit is due. And that's, that's an area that I feel that we're really going to focus in on and hone in now. And hone in on whenever it is the fight with Marab's going to take place. And I can't wait to speak to you about that. But the verdict scorecard, I don't know if you were familiar with verdict and the global scorecard. Again, I know this is not the official judges, but when you start to kind of build up an evidence kit and you start to make a case study in terms of why a lot of people thought you won this fight, the verdict users gave you rounds two, three, and five very unanimously. Um, and so I don't know. If that's any consolation, it feels like the fans and the people watching at home kind of thought you won that fight. Uh, yeah, yeah, could have, should have, and would have, but yeah, I think I think Burdick is uh, it just puts it in perspective, man. You know what I mean? It's like it's like the scientific evidence of probability, and uh, you know that's one thing that you know Captain Captain Eric he he always kind of brought up was like, hey, dude, look, this is this is what the card is. But obviously, being there live and even watching on TV, even be even fighting there live and actually watching on TV, if you're there live, like that, even feels more of a of an actual real situation because you're able to see the fight, you're able to hear the blows, you're able to kind of feel and engage a little bit more than you would actually on TV. So there's a lot to learn from uh, from that. But I mean, I appreciate it from verdict, but at the end of the day, I'm. You know, I'm here without a belt. <laughs> when, you know, but I all, but I know, I know that there's a lot of work to do, and I'm excited to go back to the gym and start pinpointing some of that stuff because this stuff that I already know, but obviously I have to do it when, the, when, when, you know, when the time really comes. When Bruce 
is announcing the results and the referee has both your hands. Did you feel confident enough in that moment that your hand was about to get raised in victory? Mm. When I fought Demetrius, I felt like I I felt I when I fought, when I fought Demetrius, I was confident that it was there. When, when, when with this one, I was just like I was a little more pissed off knowing that I knowing that there's things that I could have adjusted it did right. You know, so I, I don't know. I was a little eerie. I was a kind of, I was a bit up in the air. You know, because I did, I, I, because I did end, uh, very good. Also, the second, I mean, the just the rest of the rounds were kind of a, a question mark to me, quite honestly. And that's just the honest truth. Sure. And I'm pretty sure Sterling will probably say the same thing, and that's kind of where I land. So the, so the answer is, I just didn't know. I really mm -hmm. didn't know. After the result was read, there was a moment where you've got Dana White there helping you get your gloves off, and in, and watching it live in the moment. I think me and everyone else thought, oh, is Henry about to retire? Was there a moment in your mind where you're thinking to yourself, I'm going to call it time right now? Or what were you thinking in that moment? Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking, this is it for me. This is it for me because I don't, I don't fight. I don't, I don't want to be the second best or the third best or the fourth best. I don't want to be a top 10 fighter. I don't. I'm not in this game to fight everybody to get back to the title, to the, to, you know, to the title once again. That's just that's just not me. I'm too competitive. I'm too I'm too greedy, and uh, you know. I, but but the, but there was still a question mark. Was like how good how good could I still get, you know? And uh, I've been here before, Sandy. Like I over in 2007, being 31st in the world to winning the Olympics the whole next year, 365 days 365 days later, I was the Olympic champ. When I got knocked out by Demetrius, and I had to wait two and a half years to fight the man again to be able to get a victory over him. So I just feel like my story with a lot of stuff that has happened. Um, I don't know, man. I, I, I get like what's made me what's made me me was maybe the triple C has always been the comebacks. So I'm also excited to see where is it that I could take my mind, body, and soul, and uh, and come back and and retain this belt once again. You didn't waste any time. Um, I think what is it within 24 hours, you threw out the tweet and you called your shot. You're like, I want Mirab. What was it about? And what was that process like for you, that decision making process where you go from thinking about retiring in the cage for a split second to no, I'm not done and I want Mirab? Yeah, because I know I know the things that I could have done right. I know the adjustments that had to be made. And I and, and there's a lot of things. It's, it's a complex it's a complexity full of things. Even even the storyline of Marab being best friends with Algerman, I'm like, oh, I like that too, because I know, I know that Sterling, I, I know that more likely Sterling's going to get past Sean O'Malley. And I think it just sets it up really, really good with, uh, you know, with me being not his friend, where he's supposed to relinquish the belt after he beats Sean, but uh, he's going to have no other, no other way to go but to fight me once again. Well, it, f it feels like we could be in a situation where if you know Sterling versus you know O'Malley, they're talking about maybe August, Boston, but regardless of whenever that fight takes place, co-main event, Henry Sahudo versus Marav Davalashvili makes a lot of sense, no? I like it. I like it. It was as, personally, it's my idea. This is why when I did send the tweet, I'm just like, no, let's put us on the co-main event. I, th I think the Bantamweight division, especially what's going on with obviously with the Triple C and the trash talk and Aljamain and his, his character, and obviously Sean O'Malley, and then now, you know, Marab, who's, who's been able to, you know, and been willing to actually sell fights. I think it makes perfect sense. I don't think there's a better division right now in the UFC uh, that's better than 135 pounds. It's it's got theatrics. It's got a novella type of feel to it. It's got the best talent in the UFC. So I think it makes perfect sense. I hope Marab is is willing and able to be ready for August 19th. And as a matter of fact, August 19th when I when I won the Olympics, that's my most special day. So it'd be really hard to beat me. Wow. And uh, there's a there's a chip on my shoulder, Sandu. And uh, my training partner said the best one knows me very very well. He's like, man, he's like, man, people have no idea. People have no idea, man, that when this when this guy's determined and really uh and has something that's that's just tugging at him. So that's that's kind of where I fall in. Um, 
You know, it, it sat in. I take the defeat. Um, I take it like a man. But then again, and now it's now it's time to now it's time to climb up that mountain once again, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. I can feel that energy just coming resonating from you right now. Like this is not someone that's even contemplating retirement right now. I feel like you want to get back to work and uh, get a fight booked with Mirab ASAP and get back to business. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. I I can't let this way. I can't. I just can't, man. If, if there's if anything, the Aljamain fight was a tune up. Was a tune up for something bigger. Even even with the loss, because I know I know what what is it that I have to do and. And how I don't want to feel that feeling once again of feeling second place. And you feel Sterling can get past O'Malley fairly easily, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Sterling, Sterling doesn't have grappling. So if Sterling is able to kind of take, you know, put it on his feet, but no, I do believe Ultimate Sterling is going to press him, get him against the cage. And then, you know, if he's able to take me down, he can take any, any of those guys down. So Sean's, uh, Sean's going to be in trouble. You know, Sean, Sean just relies on his striking. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure he works in the jiu-jitsu, but in, in MMA, it's just different. And I do believe that Sterling's going to get on top of him and just pretty much just hurt him. And the fight with Marab, would you prefer that to be a three-round fight or would you like a five-round fight with him? Um, I, I really don't care, man, whether it's a three or a five. Uh, I just like the storyline of us being in Boston or, uh, you know, under that. I, I like that better. But if, if, if they want to do five, they want to pay a little bit more, I'm up for that too. And I feel like for Marab, yeah, for Marab, this is easily the biggest fight available for him because he's choosing not to fight his teammate while he remains champion. So when you look at the lay of the land, who better than for him to fight than than Henry Cejudo? No. Yeah, yeah. If I was in his position, I would be grabbing that. I mean, you get a chance to you know to beat a legend, man, to be somebody who's a two division champ. You know, he he gets that opportunity, and. uh I think it's. I think he feels like it's a good fight, especially from what he saw with his friend. And uh, you know, I got to. I got to hit a switch here. Here, I personally like the matchup too. Even with Aljamain, there are just certain things that I would adjust with Aljamain. Looking back at the fight, what is it that is that I could actually win? And that's bringing, that's being a competitor and really being able to steal the fight towards the ends of the rounds, like I typically plan to. You know, a lot of things that I did wrong in that fight more than anything and uh i'm kicking myself in the arse but like i said i take full accountability i take it like a man i take it in the chin and uh now i'm after now i'm after his butt buddy running back close fights is nothing new in the ufc we've seen max holloway and volkanovsky do it three times we know what the stakes are if you get this marab fight and you defeat him it's the perfect storyline, like you said. You beat the best friend. You set up the rematch. If Sterling gets past O'Malley, boom, the stars align. It's it's a, everything set up there for a rematch. What are the stakes for you though, if you can't get past Marab Dvalishvili? It's that's not even that's not even entering my head. No, if I can't beat a dude like that, yeah, I mean it's I don't even want to think. Of, I don't even I don't even want to answer that because I don't even want to take it there. The only thing I know is I don't want to feel that feeling again, and uh, I don't like feeling I don't like feeling second to nobody. So that's a lot of the motivation. Sometimes not the the eagerness or the desire of winning, but it's not feeling that, not feeling that pain of losing. So I just can't I just can't take it there. Like th th there's only one objective, and that's to take that dude out. Stylistically, break him down. How do you, this guy's got a gas tank? He's got incredible grappling. Where do you see some of the weaknesses, and and how do you think you can get it done against him? No, but I just think those are just all his strengths. You know, he's different than Sterling because he doesn't have the length of Sterling. He's got better cage work than Sterling. I will give him that. But now that I've been into it with his best friend, I, I know what is it that he's more like he's going to bring. He's going to bring a different stop with the same pressure, the same tactics. You know, so and that, that's more like where if I was him, I would probably take the fight. You know, I know what I got to do. Great angles. Now that I got my feet wet and after three years, I'm going to... I'm going to be firing at all cylinders. He seems to be quite the character as well. Did you see him take Sean O'Malley's Michael Jackson thriller jacket and kind of get in between <laughs> those two guys? That was hilarious, no? Yeah, it's funny, man. Maraba, he's a good dude, man. He's a good dude. You, you can tell. Uh, uh, you know, he's been nothing but cool to me. Like, he, he understands the, you know, the selling, the, you know, selling the fights. But he's also a killer. And, uh, 
you know, I look forward to that killer because I know I'm a killer too. And I know what I'm capable of doing when, when my mind, body and soul is all into it. So, you I know, can't. I, I don't, like, I don't even, I, I don't even want to talk. I don't even like talking, but I just know what, whatever it is that I have to do. I got, I got to get the job done. I really hope this fight gets made because I think it makes so much sense and it will just, again, just the bantamweight division, it'll be a showcase once again with Sterling, O'Malley, you and Marab, and it will just set up a future title fight rematch between you and Sterling if both of you get the dub there. Um, one other thing that I wanted to kind of speak to you about is the the layoff that you had. You went through so many things personally. You got married. You had a kid. Congratulations. You're going to have a baby boy. You've already got a daughter. Yeah. How has yeah. how has being a husband and how has being a father changed you both personally, but also professionally as a fighter? Um, it's, it's much bigger than you, you know, like whatever it is that I do is like, obviously like to be a world champ, I'm doing it for me, not for my family. Like this is, this is a, this is, this is a selfish goal that I want to obtain, but the incentive that comes with you being a world champ or fighting for a world title, I mean, it's just the incentive piece. I mean, that, that's the stuff that goes for my family and that's the stuff that I t literally fight for. You know what I mean? I fight for freedom. I fight to have more time and more precious time to be able to provide. And those are the things that kind of go on in my head in order for me to be, to be the best father and having the best fathers having more time. You know, this is the reason why even now as, uh, you know, people call me a coach, I'm, I'm more of a teacher, counselor, a mentor than an actual coach because you're not going to see me every Saturday at some event in Sioux Falls City, freaking Iowa, you know what I mean, or somewhere in Idaho. Like, I'm just there to teach, take take what you can take, grab it, like fly with it. And because there's so much, it's bigger to me than just, it's bigger to me than just me, you mm. know. And to me, now, now that I'm a father, it's just different. You know, before I, I maybe do the commentating stuff, maybe maybe fly every other weekend. But now it's like, I, I can never take those days from my precious family to be with them. If your kids grow up and they say, hey, dad, I want to be a professional fighter, what is your reaction? Uh, I'm not going to be one. Of, I'm not going to be one of those dads. Like, oh, I don't think they should. You know, be calculated, be mm. smart, understand your abilities. Is this what you really want to do? Understand the roller coasters of the fight game. You're not always going to win. But the losing portion, that's that's what makes you. That's what makes you understand your flaws and how tough are you? Can you get up after falling? Because I've been there before. And that's more where I would take it. You know what I'm saying? Like, and yeah, I, I would I would love for them, first and foremost, if they, if they do decide to fight, is is have the fundamentals down and have the fundamentals down right. And before they do any type of fight, they're gonna wrestle if they decide to, because that's the best base in the world. You mentioned the coaching, and that's something that you were very heavy on uh, during the layoff. And you've got so many more reps in now, you know, coaching the likes of John Jones for a little bit during his camp. And have you enjoyed that process of, of being a little bit more hands on with up and coming talent, with prospects, with champions, some of the elite fighters in the world? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, it's, it's something that I, I enjoy teaching now. I enjoy giving. I enjoy giving advice. I, I I've been there and I've done that, and I think uh, I think people see that. Whether, and I'm gonna I'm gonna critique myself in this fight with with uh, with Alger. I mean, like I'm gonna do a fight feedback on my own self, and I'm gonna let you guys know the flaws and the mistakes that I made, and how it's that I actually have to get better. Because you know, if I'm gonna walk it, I gotta talk and I gotta do it. So you know, there's gonna be a nice little fight feedback coming on. I try yours truly, Triple C. And, you know, making those adjustments and, you know, sharing them to the world, because I do believe, man, like, like, you know, kind of shutting down the persona of more, you know, kind of laying off of the cringe a little bit. Like I've, you know, a lot of more people have been able to really see deeper inside me and, and understand a little bit more, but the cringe, ain't, the cringe ain't a hundred percent over. <laughs> Listen, I'll be honest, like uh, your mileage may vary with the cringe. I personally like your legit life story, where you've come from, the ups and downs, the trials and tribulations, you're a self-made man, what you've been able to accomplish. That is what I think is the most inspiring uh, element of who you are as an individual, who you are as a person, as a professional fighter. I actually wish that that was the story that could get told a little bit more often. 
um, by the UFC and by the promotion. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's kind of the low hanging fruit is the face off the press conference, the interviews, the trash talk on what you're wearing and what you're saying and things of that nature. Yeah, of course, man. 100 percent, 100, 100 percent. But yeah, I mean, this is why I even had it just because of that. You know, was, but exa exactly, you just hit the nail on the head, Sandy. Like everything that you just said, I've been trying. You know, in the beginning, I figured it would be more like that, but it doesn't work that way. Yeah. And I've actually learned to, I've actually learned to really love my character because it because it is part of who I am. I am corny. I do like to razzle feathers. I do love the embracement of of maybe not being like or taking the risk of doing some crazy and obnoxious shit. So people can be so people cannot like you. They can, you know, they can root against you. You know, so don't fool yourself either because that is part of who I am. On top of everything you just said, you know, one of seven, uh one of seven kids, immigrant family came here illegally, won the Olympics, mom wasn't able to go to, to the Olympics due to her citizenship status. You know, my dad died the year before the Olympics. Uh, me being ranked 31st in the world to become an Olympic champion the year prior. Um, me getting knocked out by Demetrius Johnson, you know, to be able to, you know, do whatever I can to let go of my coaches, travel the world, let my ego down to get better, to come back and actually beat him. You know, to going up to divisions, beating TJ Dillish, Dominic Cruz, and Marlon Marais to becoming the fourth simultaneous uh, UFC champion in history. I mean, that's really who I, that's really who I am. And, you know, I hope people can also see that that other side, but don't fool yourself, dude. I, I am I am a little spontaneous and goofy and, and cringy and, and all that, but it's it's only for a reason and a purpose, and that's to motivate the sh so I'm not the laughing stock. You know, everything that you said there about your story and you kind of summarized it in a in a nutshell, but there was a fantastic, almost like a, a players tribune style uh story with you and the, the boys over at Verdict. And I'm actually gonna link that. Uh, in this YouTube video, because it's it's super inspirational, uh, it's 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 emotional, and you kind of really lay out what you've been through in a lot of detail there. I I, I thought that to be a fantastic read. Um, but leaning into the kind of character, a bit of a switching gears a little bit. A few years ago, you appeared on AEW television, and I, at that time, I thought, oh, this is perfect. You know, Henry knows, you know, what it takes to you know be a character. Some of the best um, athletes that have you know. Pro, you know transitioned into professional wrestling have been guys that have got a, a traditional wrestling background there were rumors i thought that you had signed with them or you were going to sign with them what actually happened there with aw and is there still potential interest for you to become a professional wrestler um yeah but it, it all, that probably not now like okay. even in the beginning before i signed with the ufc like we we're in talks with the wwe you know i was going to be the atomic flea you know, they're going to, you know, I had thought about maybe even signing out that talk to Jerry Briscoe at that time. And, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, they're going to fly me out to Orlando and do that, all, that, that whole trial stuff. But being a WWE fan, WWF, you know, in, in, you know when I started watching it, I'm 36, man. I kind of stopped watching once I started real wrestling. But uh, it, uh, yeah, it did intrigue me at the same time. I, I knew that if I'm going to use my body, I might as well fight and do the real stuff, you know, I'm not saying that the WWE isn't real. It's a hundred percent, but I'm talking about competitively. Right. And uh, so I honestly I never really, I never want to travel like crazy. Like they do. And everyone, I didn't want to get the throne like Rey Mysterio. You know, I think those were the biggest things. I, I just felt like my body was, I didn't want my body to break. So that being said, I think if I was to do the WWE or AEW, I would like to do one-offs. Like I don't, I just won't see myself doing that stuff for, you know, for for a very long time. Even though I do believe that I could be really, really good at it. And I worked out with uh, Chavo Guerrero. He's giving me lessons, and he's like, "Bro, you're a natural man. Like you get stuff right away." I was like, "Well, I grew up watching it, man, and I did amateur wrestling. And I fought, so I, and I understand like the the acting portion of when you get hit, and you gotta, you know what I'm saying? Like it's uh." There's things that come natural to me, and I think uh, something like the WWE or AEW would uh, would be one of them. Well, you've got Endeavor that now you know owns both UFC and WWE, and there's been plenty of guys that have done the special appearance, the one-off. You know, DC was a special guest referee last year. Uh, maybe we can have Henry Sahuda come in 
uh, as a part of the LWO or, you know, something fun for one of their special events in the future, like a WrestleMania or a SummerSlam? Would that be something you'd be interested in? Of course, 100 percent, 100 percent. But I think now with with the family, I think it's just, you know, that's my part. That's number one. But if you decide to, you know, money talks, mm. you know, if they want to do something like that, I, 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 I you know, I'm open for anything. One thing that you can refer to earlier on is the content that you've been building on your YouTube channel. And one of the things I love to see fighters do, both active fighters and fighters that have retired, is kind of build their social media, build a YouTube channel, because that's something that you can own and monetize. And it's something that stays with you post your, you know, your fight career. At what point, because you're one of the guys that have done a really good job here, you and the team that you've built have done a fantastic job with your YouTube channel. It does, you know, great views. The The content's fantastic. Previews, breakdowns, reviews, everything. When did you decide to kind of flip the switch and, and really put a lot of effort into doing something like that? Yeah, I think uh, I think once I got done with the... I, I think I started kind of seeing it with the Triple C and Schmo show when I was working with the Schmo. But I also knew that, uh, you know, I became really good friends with Michael, Michael Wansover, who was the producer out at ES one of the producers out at ESPN for Sports Station. And uh I just, you know, we became good friends and, you know, kind of started we both kind of started chit chatting. How's it that we kind of create something cool? So, you know, he took it upon himself and then we ended up coming to a conclusion that, hey dude, why don't we just start working with each other and let's see how this works. And I think uh I think the, the raw content that we've been able to give to the fans and them getting the, getting a chance to actually get to know me a little bit more has really raised the level. And I can tell by my following, I could tell even in this fight with Alchemy Sterling in New Jersey, I mean, how many, how many of those people were actually going for me? Like I thought I was the hill for the longest where I wanted to be, but it seems like now I'm just being more likable and it's, it's crazy, but that's typically how it works. It's funny how like many they, people hated Mike Tyson. Right. Going back to coach Cejudo, you know, obviously you worked with, with John Jones already in the, the lead up to the Cyril Gunn fight. Have you spoken to him since then? And would you be interested or have you even spoken to him about being involved when he does put his camp together for the Miocic fight? You know, we haven't talked. I mean, we just congratulated. I think he just, you know, he said thank you. But, but not really, man. When things get closer, obviously, John's got a family too. And John's John's to himself quite a bit. He's not like uh, like me and Demetrius are pretty close now, and I can honestly say that. You know, me and Demetrius Johnson, like we're just chit chatting. We, like we'll, we'll text like every like every week now, man. We'll kind of he's a little closer with Michael Wands over, but uh, but we'll just text just random stuff. You know what I mean? Like just you know, what do you think, man? Retire? What do you think of my fight? Just kind of try to. What do you think about me not? You know, wanting to retire? What do you think of me going back? You know, what I mean? just just feeding from each other. But uh, I feel like Jones is just a, Jones is it's, he's a little more to himself, man. I think from a lot of stuff that he's been through, mm. and I respect that. You know, he he just wants to be with his family. He's a, from what I know, I know he's a good family man. He's he's a, he's a good girl dad, and uh, he's got too many kids on his plate to just hang out with people. But I will say this: I know when, I know typically when things get closer, he will reach out. He will reach out, and I think this fight, particularly with Stipe, you know, this is this is the toughest fight of his career. But honestly, like, like, like just thinking about it. Yes, Stephen may be a little bit older, but Stephen also has a heart of a of a lion, and to, to be able to stop a guy like uh, Daniel Cormier, it just shows what you're capable of doing. You know, so I just hope you know. John knows if he ever needs help, I'll, I'll always be here for him. You know, I do believe that legends take care of legends, and I uh, hope that legends could always repeat that in, amongst each other. And do that because it's uh it's important now we're a secluda club that should always look out for each other and particularly the ufc champions the olympic champs who have been there because it's super important for for us the people who have been there to be able to give that helping hand that's exactly what i told daniel i'm like daniel you can't be mad at me bro i says don't be mad at me daniel like we got to take care of each other bro whether you, you like him or you hate him or not I just, I would do that for you in any day of the week. And I would do that for anybody, even my rivals in any day of the week as well. Well, speaking of, uh, there was a great clip of Conor McGregor having a, a bit of banter with you. And the good thing about you, Henry, is you give it, but you you take it too. 
<laughs> and when, when and, and the content comes thick and fast, like the the the, the event ends, Connor is obviously posting the video that he's posted. <laughs> I see your reaction on your YouTube channel. Uh, when it comes, I, I feel like you and Connor need to do something. I don't know what it is. It's a shame that he's already involved with Michael Chan on the Ultimate Fighter because I feel like you two would have made great uh, coaches. Uh, paso la aquí, cara. Paso la aquí. Yeah, you know what? I could have helped Connor quite a bit. You know, hmm. I think he knows that. Is there some reason why he respects me? Say hi, Tricky. Say hi. Hello. Who's that? You want to give that to Kitchy? You want to give that to Kitchy? Huh? Yeah. And like you said, Sandy, I can give it, but I can also take it. Yeah. Like I'm not, I think people think, oh, this is going to be crazy. It's like, no, I'm not going to be a Ronda Rousey and just leave a storm off and not be able to give it to somebody. You know, it's like, no. I'm going to take what he has to say and I'm going to watch it. And if it's true, it's true, you know, but you'll see the adjustments according, according to, you know, you'll see, you'll see adjustments. And obviously it, it has been a minute, man. And I, and I hate to say that, but I know how good I've been. I know what I've done and I'm confident. And I'm satisfied with everything that I've done in my career. You know, this is just icing on the cake now. Yeah. This is just time to make a little more money for her too. For sure. And, you know, there's a little chip on the shoulder. No, you, you, you can't do that. You know, as you someone know, that, as someone that's made a, a comeback after a lengthy layoff, Connor is on the cusp of doing the same thing. How do you think he fares against Michael Chandler? And and obviously he's coming from a, a you know serious leg injury as well. Yeah, I I, don't, I personally I don't even think Connor's ever going to fight again. I think a lot of it's just talk. It's too big. You go down to 155 pounds, weighing 200 pounds. You think that's going to make you stronger? That's not the way it works. But could I have helped them? Yeah, watch my fight feedbacks. And then watch Connor reply to everything that I'm saying because I'm right. It's funny with Connor because like, I feel like he's, you know, the, the ultimate fight is starting soon, but we still haven't had an announcement with regards to when his fight with Chandler is supposed to take place. So you don't think he, that fight's even going to take place. You, you don't think Connor's ever coming back? No. Um, no, not really. Not really. I think he's made his money. That's another reason why you might you may want to like a guy like Conor McGregor because he doesn't need to come back. And if Conor does come back, it's really it's not even because of desire or the willing of the wanting to win. It's really about ego, mm. you know. And that could go against them, and that could also help him. Like, like even for me, there is a bit of an ego if he wanted to come back. It's a smart ego, though. You know, because I just can't leave shit like this, and I and I probably feel like that's how Connor feels. The only thing, the only difference is, is I performed a lot better than him, and then I'm coming back right away, so I don't lose, so I can gain a little bit of that lost that lost time that I've had. Right. A few more things, and I really appreciate the time, Henry. Um, want to ask you about Bo Nickel because I think. Anyone that's just a pure MMA fan that doesn't really, you know, follow the collegiate wrestling scene, don't perhaps understand, you know, what his ceiling could be in MMA. From your perspective, how good do you think he can be in the UFC? Um, I think, yeah, I think I think Bo could take it as far as he could take it. I think he could become I think he could become champion one day. I really do. But can he take his time? Does he really understand the game of mixed martial arts? Because you can compete right now and be a great competitor and win, but he need to really understand the game of mixed martial arts. I got humbled by by DJ. DC got humbled by Jones. It is a different sport, and we have to respect that. But I think stylistically, right now, if you put if, if right now, Right now, if, if you, if you just get him to go up against the, the champ right now, Israel Asanya, he beats him. The guys that I'm worried about with the guy with Bo Nick was a guy like Paula Bohashinya, who's fought you Romero, who has good takedown defense. Amara Vittori, who's just a strong human, will fight you, will defend you. Like if you take him down, he's gonna get up. A Robert Whitaker is what really scares me against a guy like for Bo Nickel, a guy that that has great striking, but also could take you down. And, 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 and if you do take him down, he's getting back up. That will scramble. So, But I would take my chances somehow if he was to just bypass the line, go after Israel. I would 100 stylistically just kind of seeing everything as a whole. Top collegiate style wrestling. 
if when when Bo Nickel really decides to take his time, if he does take his time and fights the right fights within a couple of years, I can see that UFC butt around his waist. No doubt about it. Amazing. One more thing. Jake Paul, Nate Diaz. Were you surprised that this is the path Nate Diaz took as a free agent to get this boxing fight yeah. with Jake Paul uh, done and dusted? And how do you think that plays out? Nate Diaz, Nate Diaz, is, he's a smart cat, man. I know he gets a lot of stuff for being a little, you know, kind of a little gangster-like, but no, he's a really smart human. I can see him, uh, I can see him taking out Jake Paul just based on being there with high-level fighters. You know what I mean? Like, I just think Nate, Nate Diaz's volume will be very, very problematic for a guy like Jake Paul. So, I think he's smart. I think he. I think after this Nate Diaz, after this Jake Paul fight, I think he comes back and I think he fights Connor once again. That'll be huge. We need to see it. That trilogy needs to take place in the UFC, right? Yeah, one hundred percent. All right. Final thing, Henry. Uh, this is the way I like to end all my conversations. Something a little bit light, a little bit fun. It's called the bit for social and it's different every week. And for you, what we're going to do is we're going to go with gold, silver, or bronze. I'm going to give you a bunch of categories and you're going to give me who you think is a gold medalist, silver medalist, and bronze medalist. And we're going to start with MMA promotions. One of these is not going to even make the podium. The UFC, Bellator, PFL, and one. Give me the gold medalist, silver medalist, and bronze medalist. Well, the gold medalist, it has to be the UFC. The silver medalist, that one's hard, man. That one's hard, but you, we have to go Bellator. And then number three, it's going to have to be one FC. You know, with Dimitri, with a lot of the stuff that they're doing, it's, I think that's the way you're reckoning. And obviously, unfortunately, PFL, as tough as PFL is getting it's going, yeah, you'd have to, you'd, you'd have to sneak it in that, you had to sneak it in at number four. Okay. UFC bantamweight champions, not including yourself. Gold, silver, and bronze. Hit me. Gold, silver, and bronze. That's not me. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to have to go uh, Nurmerga Madoff, Umar, gold. At bantamweight. You want to give Umar... The gold medalist. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. At, and then I'd probably go San Hagen. And then uh, who else is there? And then probably Marab. Where I would probably, I would probably sneak Marab, maybe, maybe silver medals and then San Hagen bronze. Okay. MMA goats between John Jones, GSP, and Anton Silva, gold, silver, and bronze. Yeah, it's uh, Jones, Gold, Silva, uh, Anderson Silva, second, and then George St. Pierre, bronze. Okay. Trash talkers, Conor McGregor, Colby Covington, and Chael Sonnen. Yeah, God. I'm going to have to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got you. Yeah, you would have to go Conor, what he's been able to do. And then I'd probably go. I'd probably go Kobe and then and then Uncle Cho. Okay. And the final one, influencer boxers. Jake Paul, Logan Paul, and KSI. Jake Paul. I think KSI now. And then Logan Paul. Amazing. Henry, like I said at the top of the episode, you are a man of your word. I really appreciate you giving me some of your time. I cannot wait to see you fight again. The story is not over and I really hope this fight with Marab gets done and I hope it's on the same card as Sterling versus O'Malley of course man tweet it out I'm ready I appreciate it Sandu for uh, and I apologize too for the tardiness but uh well, good. I'm not in my word I told you you're the first interview that I've done since my fight so I you know I hope you guys enjoyed it M much respect Henry and uh, check out the YouTube channel you're doing big things there I love it there he is Henry Cejudo Amazing. We'll talk to you soon, Henry. Take care.